Hello everyone. Uh, today I'd like to talk about one of the least understood and I think uh, perhaps most important phenomena, um, the, the life phenomena of life or the, or the origin of life. Now, um, one might argue that uh, life or biological life uh, that we observe should be explained, can be explained by the anthropic principle. In other words, it must exist in order for us to be able to ask questions about it. So there is um, not much to explain. Um, I don't think that this is entirely correct, but um, and I'm not going to, you know, uh, criticize the anthropic principle too much. Uh, all I want to emphasize is that it may still be useful to figure out the, the technical details of the life and, and the exact definition of life. Now, perhaps this will enable us to create a laboratory experiment where we can create the right conditions for, for life and then uh, maybe recreate these phase transitions in the lab. So let's see. Now, unfortunately, um, we have to pause right away and uh, uh, declare that the, the usual tools we use in physics, the tools of classical uh, quantum physics, are not going to be useful. Uh, in answering such questions. Um, so the, the hope that I have is perhaps this neural physics um, may res rescue us, may help us. So um, in other words, if the entire universe is a neural network, uh, what can it tell us about the life and about the origin of life? Now recall that uh, in neural physics, there are two types of degrees of freedom. Uh, one is very much familiar to us from physics, and um, that is uh, described by something that I will call activation dynamics. But then there is also the second type of degrees of freedom, um, uh, the trainable degrees of freedom that is described by the second type of dynamics that is known as learning dynamics. So we have a familiar dynamics, activation dynamics, and very much unfamiliar to us uh, learning dynamics. And what happens is that the two processes, the two types of dynamics, um, they kind of work in opposite direction, according to the second law of learning. So if activation dynamics tries to increase the entropy, the uh, learning dynamics is trying to decrease the entropy. And so this, of course, complex, complicates the problem, but also perhaps uh, gives us um, a, a toolbox that may be sufficiently rich to model the life and model the origin of life uh, phase transition. Now, so perhaps a necessary condition for, for any system uh, to be considered life is for its uh, total entropy to decrease. Now, um, and, and that means that uh, the learning dynamics in a system must be dominating over the activation dynamics. However, we have to be very careful um, because whether entropy decreases or increases depends on the environment. On the environment where the system is, where you put it in. So, uh, for example, if you have a, a system which is uh, in some environment and it's strongly coupled to this environment, then perhaps even small changes in, in the environment produce large changes in the system uh, due to activation dynamics. And then for such systems, the, the dynamics would be dominating by activation, and so the entropy would be uh, growing, and um, you would not be considering it as a, as a living system. Now, on the other hand, if the coupling to the environment is only weak, then small changes in the environment do not significantly change the the, the states of the of the system. Uh, but nevertheless, th that those changes in the environment can be learned. Now, for such a system, the learning dynamics would be dominating uh, and the total entropy can de decrease and uh, such a system can be considered uh, living. Uh, so perhaps this uh, weak coupling to the environment is a, is a condition, it may be a necessary condition, but it may not be a sufficient condition to describe a system, um, at least in the usual, a living system, at least in the usual uh, biological sense. Uh, for example, if we have an uh, environment which is too simple or the system is too simple, then it may be able to learn all it can uh, very fast. 
uh, even if it is weakly coupled to it, and then uh, it would quickly uh, reach a state of the learning equilibrium, um, and the entropy would remain constant. Now, perhaps such a system that quickly reaches the equilibrium, we would not be considered, uh, we would not be calling a living system. Again, this is just uh, a definition, but perhaps what we call a biological living system is the system that is learning for extended periods of time. Now, um, and, and on the other hand, if we have an environment which is sufficiently complex, described by many, many parameters, these parameters can be changing in time. And at the same time, you have a learning system that is sufficiently complex. It also contains a large number of uh, trainable parameters. Uh, now, this trainable parameters not only um, um, exist there, but their, their number can, can increase. Um, then the entropy can, in principle, continue decreasing indefinitely, and the system uh, can be considered living. So you need both a complex environment and sufficiently complex system with kind of access to a large number of trainable variables, maybe even infinite. Um, so now I think we, we can at least uh, formulate the problem of the origin of life. Now, uh, for a learning, a learning system to achieve a living uh, state uh, in a biological sense, it must have two properties. First of all, it must have only weak connections to the environment, maybe previously unknown environment that is trying to learn. And secondly, it has to gain access to, to uh, a reservoir of uh, trainable variables, uh, perhaps external to the, to the uh, learning system itself. Now, uh, the, the, the first one seems to be a trivial task. You know, all subsystems are connected uh, in, in this uh, framework of the world as a neural network. Uh, and it's relatively easy to establish uh, weak connections to the environment. But the second condition is, is less trivial, and so perhaps um, uh, it would take um, a, an effort for the learning system to learn how to use the external, uh, uh, to, how to use the external resources, um, external trainable resources, uh, perhaps by, by, um, by sharing it. And of course, those trainable resources uh, external trainable resources uh, for the system can they they can be either uh, in a physical space as we discussed before three dimensional physical space around us around the uh, the learning system or in the hidden space and uh, the external trainable resources in the physical space uh, are known as um, genotype type uh, variables or biological genes now the external resource trainable resources in the hidden space one might call psychotype variables or psychological genes. Now, of course, the first type of variables are very well known and we know that they are very real. Uh, the later, later variables are only a speculation, just to emphasize that it, it doesn't really matter for the learning system where it stores external uh, trainable variables as long as it's uh, able to use it and share. Um, now, anyways, um, that um, in an example of a learning system that might have no access to the external trainable variables, maybe like molecules or atoms, and uh, a system that does have access to this external or shared trainable variables, maybe like uh, cells or organisms, um, and um, uh, transitioned from a state where there were no access to the external trainable variables to a state where there are, uh, we may call uh, a phase transition or the origin of uh, life phase transition. Now, the point is this phase transition wouldn't happen automatically, uh, and it's only at certain temperatures where this is, becomes a good idea uh, to use the external resources. Um, now, uh, mathematically speaking, the phase transition can be described as a transition from um, ensemble, grand canonical ensemble of say molecules before uh, and uh, to a grand canonical with no shared trainable resources to a grand canonical ensemble of organisms with shared uh, trainable resources like um, genotype variables. Um, now after, after that, the, the, this newly discovered algorithm of uh, sharing the resources can be recorded into those trainable variables and this algorithm can be passed on. 
Now, uh, as, as the time progresses and learning continues, the new algorithms can be added to those resources. We already discussed the self-modeling algorithm as one of them, uh, but uh, that comes much later. And so at that point, the, the system would already be considered uh, live, according, at least according to, to our definition. Um, now, it's uh, very important to emphasize, perhaps once again, that this phase transition would not have taken place if the environment would be rapidly changing uh, or it had a high learning temperature. Um, now, the, the learning temperature is a generalized concept for the physical temperature, but nevertheless, it still describes the amount of uh, disorder or how difficult it is. Uh, to, to learn a given environment. Now, um, now if, the, if the temperature remains, however, it depends, it remains sufficiently low, then uh, the system can continue to, to learn, decrease, and at some point this uh, phase transition would, uh, would, uh, would take place. So you don't really want to have a, a wild, uh, rapidly changing environment. Now, um, another interesting limit is uh, if the learning temperature actually becomes too low, uh, then the environment becomes, in a way, too simple for a learning system. And then uh, a learning equilibrium can be reached very quickly. At that point, the learning system would kind of learn everything it could and the learning would, would and the entropy would stop decreasing. At that point, again, uh, according to our definition, we would not be calling such a system living. It would be non-living maybe hibernating system. I don't know what would be a right uh, term for that. Okay, so um, now there are also many other interesting limits when the different parts of a larger system are kept at different learning temperatures. Perhaps some parts had already um, went through the phase transitions, other didn't. Uh, and um, they, they're interacting with each other, which makes this whole analysis uh, a lot more complex and interesting. And we'll definitely come to some of them uh, some of those uh, problems later on, especially when there are interactions that take place between different levels, right? So because uh, as we already discussed, there may be learning happening at different levels and uh, you know, there may be phase transition already took place for some level, but not, but not for the other. And um, all those questions uh, deserve a separate analysis and separate discussion that we'll definitely do um, some other time, not today, um, but that's all I had to say f f for today, for this week, and um, I'll see you next week.